In this course, our main goal is to introduce you to the basic and the most widespread distributive concepts and tools of analysis. After a brief discussion of the space over which we can apply distributive tools, we will present the main concepts and tools, ranks, percentiles, the cumulative distribution function, quantile distribution, the mean, censored quantile gaps, poverty gaps, density histograms, and kernel density. We will then briefly discuss proxies for the welfare indicator and some related issues. We will finally refer to the DASP commands that can be used to estimate some of the indicators above. Distribution in some given space is at the basis of each theory of justice. Justice can relate to several dimensions of interest, like the freedom to choose a given lifestyle or the opportunity to develop one's human capital. Broadly speaking, the literature usually refers to welfareist and non-welfareist approaches. In the context of this course, we generally refer to the welfareist approach. However, we will also touch on the non-welfareist approach when we discuss multidimensional indices. Amartya Sen is among the key contemporary economists who have contributed to rethinking the concept of economic justice in the context of economic development. He argues that we should not take into account individual differences in abilities to express satisfaction, well-being not welfare. This means that we must focus on external factors affecting welfare, such as the presence and quality of infrastructure and not on internal factors such as individual abilities, but that we should allow for differences in needs or in preferences between individuals. For simplicity, as is the case in most distributive analyses and following the welfareist approach, we assume that per capita income is a good proxy for well-being, which is observable. Of course, this assumption is not immune to criticism. One such criticism is that income does not capture goods and non-market commodities such as health, peace, freedom, etc. In what follows, we introduce the main concepts that are used extensively in the distributive analysis of well-being. In distributive analysis, individuals are often ordered according to their income level. For instance, the rank of the person with an income equal to 12 is 4. The percentile associated with a given income is simply the proportion of the population disposing of this level of income or lower. By using the previous example, and after ordering the incomes in ascending order, we can easily identify the rank and the percentile associated with each person. For instance, the individual with an income equal to 10 has the rank of 3 and the 60th percentile. In other words, 60% of individuals have an income of 10 or less. It is now useful to relate individual incomes with the percentiles that we have just introduced. This is done through the cumulative distribution function. A graphic example will be presented. The cumulative density corresponds to the percentile P, that is, as we saw earlier, the proportion of people enjoying a level of income Y or lower. In a continuous distribution, as is normally the case with income, the first derivative of the CDF is the density function. The density function, denoted by F of Y, is the proportion of individuals with an income strictly equal to Y. As I said, the maximum value of F of Y is 1. In other words, the proportion of the population with a maximum income or less is 100%. For f of y equals 0.5 on the y-axis, y corresponds to the median value of income on the x-axis. The shaded area between the horizontal line at f of y equals 1 and the CDF is equal to the average income. The lower the CDF, the higher the average income. We now represent graphically the cumulative distribution function. On the horizontal axis, we have our well-being indicator, y. 
for example, income. And on the vertical axis, we have the cumulative density, i.e. the percentage of individuals with an income inferior or equal to Y. We now introduce a new concept, which is strictly related to the previous concepts. This is the concept of the quantile. As we will see graphically in a moment, the quantile function is simply the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. On the vertical axis, we have the quantile function, and on the horizontal axis, we have the percentile or cumulative density varying between 0 and 1. The area under the quantile function is equal to the average income. The higher the quantile function, the higher the average income. The median of our cumulative density function, f equals 0 0.5, corresponds to an income of q of 0 0.5. The mean income is another word for the average income of a population. Formally, it is equal to the total income of the population, sum of yi from i equals 1 to n, divided by the size of the population, n. As we saw earlier, income yi is equivalent to the quantile corresponding to pi. The censored quantile is simply equal to the quantile when the associated income is below the poverty line and equal to the poverty line otherwise. So, the mean of the censored quantiles is the sum of all censored quantiles divided by the total population. We now introduce two very common concepts in poverty analysis, the poverty gap and the poverty line. We will come back to the concept of the poverty line in more detail later in the course. For the moment, suffice it to say that the poverty line in our context is the monetary threshold at which all individuals with an income below this threshold are defined as poor. The poverty gap is a measure of how far a poor individual is below the poverty line. The poverty gap function indicates the difference between the poverty line and income for each percentile i. Remember, q star, which is a function of p and z, is equal to z for the non-poor. Thus, the poverty gap is zero for the non-poor. It takes the maximum value between the difference between the poverty line and the income of percentile i and zero. As I said, this will take a positive value for all percentiles below the poverty line and zero for non-poor percentiles. The average poverty gap is a popular index of poverty often used to assess the average intensity of poverty in a population. Now let's see how the poverty gap looks graphically. Starting from the quantile function, which is indicated on the vertical axis, we can add a horizontal line at the poverty line level. This allows us to draw the censored quantile function. This is identified by the line set at the income y equal to z. Note the quantile function is a continuous line over the whole distribution of the percentiles. Meanwhile, the censored quantile function is an increasing line until the percentile with an income equal to the poverty line and becomes flat, i.e. parallel to the x-axis, for non-poor percentiles. For a given percentile, q, the distance between the poverty line and the censored quantile function is the poverty gap g of p equals q and depending on z. This is given by the red vertical segment. The larger ones rank p in the distribution, i.e. the richer in terms of income, the lower the poverty gap g, which becomes zero for non-poor percentiles. F of Z is the proportion of the population with incomes below the poverty line. We also call this the poverty headcount, i.e. the proportion of poor in the total population. The area between the poverty line and the censored quantile function is simply the average poverty gap. As we saw earlier, this is equivalent to the sum of the products of the individual poverty gaps Z minus Q of PI, or g of qz in the graph, and population shares pi and its preceding percentile. The density function is a helpful statistical tool to present the entire shape of the distribution of well-being. To introduce this function, 
we start by presenting another simple tool, the histogram. Similarly, there are four individuals with incomes between three and four. So the height of the histogram associated with the second bin is four divided by 10 equals 0 0.4. Let's see an application with per capita expenditures from Nigeria in 2004. As we can observe, the density function is simply a smooth representation of the histogram. It is equal to the proportion of the population with incomes between two successive bounds, where the width corresponds to the distance between these bounds. This distance, the so-called bandwidth, is predetermined. For instance, in the previous example, it was set at 1. To conduct a distributive analysis of monetary living standards, we need to find an observable and measurable proxy. Common proxies are income, expenditure and consumption, which can all vary from month to month, year to year and over a lifetime. It is well established that income typically varies more than expenditure and, in turn, expenditure varies more than consumption. Indeed, consumption is normally the least variable measure of living standards as households try to smooth their consumption over time through saving and borrowing. Of course, the choice of the appropriate proxy is often determined by what is available in the data, which is usually total household expenditure rather than consumption, as data on variations in household inventories are rare. Regardless of the proxy chosen, adjustments must be made to take into account temporal and spatial price differences, as well as differences in the size and composition of the household. A comprehensive discussion of the definitions, advantages and disadvantages of possible proxies is provided by Deaton and Zaidi, 2002. Before carrying out a distributional analysis, one must first make sure that the distributions of the chosen living standards measure are comparable across space and time. Indeed, the cost of living and, consequently, the purchasing power of households vary over time and across geographical units. This is true also when a cross-sectional survey is used, where households are often interviewed at different times of the year. Especially in developing countries, prices can be highly volatile within a year often reflecting the agricultural seasons. For this reason, living standard measures need to be expressed in the constant prices of a reference region and time period. Ideally, appropriate spatial and temporal consumer price indices are constructed and used to make valid national and regional inequality and poverty analyses. The most frequently used are the Fisher, Pasha, and Le Speyer's price indices. Surveys sponsored by the World Bank, such as the Living Standards Measurement Surveys, usually report one or more of these indices. Unfortunately, spatial CPI are not always available, especially in developing countries. Without adjustments for geographic differences in the cost of living, living standards measures cannot be used for valid interregional comparisons of inequality and poverty. In the absence of spatial sky, the ratio of regional poverty lines may be used to capture spatial differences. Let phi identify nominal income for a population of seven individuals living either in rural or urban regions. Rural is denoted by zero and urban by one and surveyed in two periods, t equals 1 and 2. Assume that we have no regional CPIs, but that we do have regional poverty lines, z, for the two periods. We adopt the prices in the rural region at time 1 as the reference prices. Comparable individual incomes are then obtained by dividing the individual nominal incomes by the ratio between the relevant poverty line, i.e. the poverty line estimated at the time and the region of the surveyed individual, and the reference poverty line. 
As it emerges from the table, there can be large differences between nominal and price adjusted incomes. In addition to price differences, we need to take into account differences in the household size and composition. In effect, to capture the living standards of individuals, total household expenditures need to be adjusted to take account of the varying needs of households of different size and composition. The simplest adjustment is to estimate a per capita measure omega, which is given by dividing our constant price welfare measure, i.e. y sub i, by household size. In doing so, we assume equal distribution of welfare within households. However, individuals may have different needs according to their gender or age, and there usually are economies of scale within a household. A useful concept that helps to improve the definition of individual welfare is that of equivalent adults which takes into account both differences in individual needs and household economies of scale. In such a case, our individual welfare omega is now obtained by dividing the constant price household welfare measure by the total equivalent adults in the household. Total equivalent adults are calculated by adopting an equivalent scale, which is a formula used to express household size in terms of an equivalent number of reference individual, typically an adult, living alone. Here we provide an example of a formula that can be used to estimate an equivalent scale. The equivalent scale, ETA, is simply the sum of one for the reference adult plus the cost of additional adults and children, which are both expressed as fractions beta of the cost of the reference adult all to the power beta scale, which captures the effect of economies of scale. Of course, any choice of equivalent scale depends on various assumptions, and so can be subject to debate. Here we provide a very simple example of adjustments for household composition using the per capita and the adult equivalent approaches. We assume that the cost of an additional adult is equal to 0.8, i.e. 80% of a single adult, and that of one child is 0.5, half of a single adult, and that there are no economies of scale, beta scale equals 1. We estimate the per capita and adult equivalent welfare indicators, which are reported in the last two rows. As shown in this example, these adjustments render total household expenditure comparable across households of different size. However, the choice of adjustment per capita versus adult equivalent affects the results significantly, which can affect the ranking and the poverty measures. For example, while the third individual is poorer than the second with the per capita measure, it is the opposite with the adult equivalent measure as the latter captures the lesser needs of children. In this course, we saw various basic concepts for distributive analysis. Individuals should first be ranked according to their income level. This generates ranks and percentiles. Histograms and density functions are useful visual tools to portray the distribution of living standards. Also, we introduced the cumulative distribution functions which show the proportions of individuals with incomes below a certain level. Income quantiles are the levels of income that coincide with certain ranks in the population distribution. They show the levels of welfare achieved at different positions in the society. Poverty gaps are the shortfalls between incomes and a poverty line. They can help assess how much incomes would need to change for poverty to be eliminated. Finally, we briefly discussed about possible monetary variables proxying living standard measures, with household expenditure being the most commonly used variable in developing countries. Any monetary variables must reflect temporal, spatial and household composition differences. The DASP Stata Package is a user-friendly and comprehensive tool for distributive analysis. Related to the concepts seen in this course, the command quinch can be used to estimate the income share 
and the cumulative income share by group quantiles. To draw quantile curves, the command C quantile can be used. Density curves can be drawn with the command C density, while poverty curves are easily drawn with the C poverty command.